So hello, I'm Danielle Hopkins. I'm the founder and executive director of Electric Perfume. And Electric Perfume, as mentioned, is a studio gallery space. It's on the Danforth Street Level storefront. We're in our fifth year. Um, I um, personally, I'm, uh, I facilitate, I curate, I am an educator teaching interaction design in post-secondary. I also am a visiting teacher artist in high schools and elementary schools in indigenous communities across Canada, helping to um, inspire uh, and encourage youth, as well as to um, uplift and uh, work toward the reclamation of voice and culture. So, and I'm Kyle Duffield. I'm the uh, technical and educational director at Electric Perfume. Uh, both of us also make uh, interactive installations. Um, here's a quick, that's our names um, in text. Um, this is Leo. Uh, isn't he a sweetheart? He's also uh, our cat in residence. So, um, what we do. So, we create, okay. You want to? Okay. Uh, at Electric Perfume, we create interactive experiences for all kinds of people. That includes drunk people, children, drunken children, on all folks in between. Uh, we also host interactive media and video game workshops, and we incubate and exhibit tech art experiences, working with other people as well as building our own. Do you want to go in the workshops for? Yeah. So um, this is just like uh, kind of like a quick image of our space. Um, we've designed, so we as artists um, face a challenge kind of trying to find media art spaces that could facilitate a lot of our technical needs and we try to design everything to be very plug and play. Um, we run a lot of workshops, we have partnerships with companies like Derivative, Touch Designer, they run a lot of workshops with us, uh, Cycling74 which runs Max MSP, we have like live coding communities that congregate around us, a lot of independent video game community devs as well. And we also kind of work uh, privately where people rent us out for like exhibitions, parties, workshops, et cetera. Um, so like as an example, um, this, is, like, this is the type of experiments we have. Like we have a three channel projection set up. This is actually using the Vive, but not in VR. But this is just an experiment of like how you can start to like draw in like surround projection, right? So like this is stuff where there's not always a space to develop the stuff and kind of test it out. And it's not necessarily has a direct application yet, but we allow artists to work on stuff like this. So moving on into some of the types of events and collaborations that we do at Electric Perfume, this is an image from a particular event series that we've held called Anything. And this is by an artist named Dogson, and we debuted the North American tour of this, and, and it since has gone through Europe. And this particular project, uh, he came to us saying, I have this tech, he's trying to figure out what next steps are for it, and we helped to develop an event around it using the space in our community that we had. So if you imagine, he, there's a performer who's in VR somewhere in the space, and people come out to the space, and we have set up uh, all around, we have, uh, different stations where people can do different art things. So we lay it out all comfortable vibes with AstroTurf, there's a pile of Lego on the floor, we have Play-Doh, we have computers set up with Photoshop, um, uh, collage materials, markers and paper, and people can make whatever they want in the space. And then we also have a couple of people on site who go around with 3D scanners and 3D scan everything that people make. And then as they do this, um, uh, it shows up in the VR world. So they send their assets to an email address and then it p falls down in the sky and this is pr projected in the three projectors throughout the room. And real time, the artist has to build a, a VR world with all of the assets that everyone in the, in the room is creating. So you end up with 3D scans of people's faces who are attending the event with a very unique experience of something that you kind of have to be there to be a part of it, to uh, have it unfold in that way. So we, um, we work hard to facilitate a space where people can come and feel comfortable to just like socialize and they're there to laugh with their friends and enjoy the silly things that pop up. And then some people, they don't even communicate with anyone at all. They just come, they want to make things and they sit in the corner and they do that. And it's comfortable for all kinds of people to just do whatever they want for something like that. And this is an example of the types of projects that we incubate, kind of trying to push experimentation and hybridize different concepts together to make something that's interesting. And 
Yeah, these are more photos of it. We also hold an event called Hypergame Storytime the Musical. Uh, we've been incubating this for since actually near the beginning of Electric Perfume, so uh, almost five years. And uh, this is an audience-driven choose-your-own-adventure led by our Dungeon Master of Ceremonies, Andrew Schenkman, who is incredibly skilled at music and coming up with words on the spot. So when the audience yells song, he has to, on the spot, come up with a song or whatever type of theme fits the story at the time that moves the story along. And it's super silly. And uh, one of the things that we've contributed to this, as well as other collaborators, is we wanted it to have like a more of a gamey vibe to it. So we have worked toward having game interfaces in the projectors in the background, where sometimes the audience controls it, sometimes it's, it's one of our team controlling it, and having that kind of playing or along in the background. And we've experimented with it. So every iteration kind of has a different thing going on, and everyone involved is trying something new every time. And it's gotten its own little following of people who come out to it. So as an example of something else that we incubate that is uh, sort of game related, but sort of different than regular game stuff and mixing with other things like improv and music. So, the, this is a photo of uh, improv artist Chris Bone in a banana suit. And <laughs> so who here likes lasers? Lasers, lasers, lasers! All right, so our first project that we had at Electric Perfume and one of our early projects was called Laser Equipped Annihilation Protocol, or the LEAP engine for short. And this is a game that Go, is the lasers that go, well, if you're thinking about Mission Impossible and Tom Cruise or Catherine Zeta Jones's butt, then you're on the wrong track because it's not about flexibility and acrobatic skill. We wanted to make this a very accessible game. So we even consulted someone about wheelchair accessibility and spacing everything so that all kinds of people can play it. And the lasers actually go on and off on timers, so it's more about platform gamer style, kind of assessing what's going on and then moving through it. And we've presented this in many different situations and had great success iterating it and having a lot of fun with it. But when we first started at Electric Perfume, um, it, as I said, it was our first thing that we sort of presented there. And Daily Planet came in and reviewed it with us. So let's go play a little bit of that video. Three, two, one, begin. Time's ticking. No, no, no! You will be annihilated. Why? Come on, no! You will be annihilated. Over. Danielle Hopkins and Kyle Duffield are a creative force to be reckoned with. We've known each other for about 13 years. We were good friends, and years later we started working together. This Toronto duo has taken video games off the screen and putting you right in the action. So you walk into a room, you see a series of fences comprised of lasers. So a project like this is an early example of our struggles with finding a place to develop a project like this and how to prototype it, how to play test it with a group of people and then present it. So we were lucky enough to have an artist residency at a makerspace at Ossington and Bloor called Site 3, if anyone knows of it. And uh, there's a lovely group of people there who are very intelligent and skilled and they help back us up with some of our we didn't know a whole lot about this stuff, and we're kind of learning. A lot of it was a lower budget. We we're DIYing a big portion of it, which brings up into question of 100 hours versus $100 and what's worth putting it into something like this. And we've made a lot of those mistakes and, and iterated even with this project alone. Um, uh, we also, oh, sorry. Uh, for something like this project, one thing you want to do when you have a bunch of later lasers is not blind children. So <laughs> we spent actually about three months looking for eye safe lasers and found that uh, a lot of the lasers that you can buy are, they say that they're one class of laser, which is the strength of them, and they're actually not that class. We tested them in a lab, and we repeatedly tested them in a lab, and uh, finally found some. And also for this, in part of our iteration, as you can see in the uh, Daily Planet video, there was a, a surveillance dome that was present. And we, so that was an early bit of it. We had this sort of surveillance vibe of it. And then we ended up making this big giant head that comes out and taunts you as you play it. So that's actually me. I am a professional floating head. 
And um, we held an event called, or series of events called Verbal Abuse Training Camp, where we invited people to come out and say nasty crap to their friends. And then we processed all the audio and roboticized it and then made the mouth kind of mouth that. So imagine you're playing this laser game and you're right about to win and you're trying to go through the laser and then it tells you you suck. So that was a fun iteration, a new version of it, and it got quite mean. Wait, is this? That That's one? the video. Yep. Oh no, Adia. What did it say there? Tried, you failed. Yes, <laughs> this is an example of it. Uh, we also presented this for uh, Ubisoft, and uh, as you can see, that we had a huge lineup at Ubisoft. And what was interesting as a social interaction for this game is it's so nasty. Like people got really mean. So this whole crowd of people here while people are playing it, they're actually cheering on the player and like shit-talking the, the big head because they're trying to support the person playing because it's so mean. And it was really interesting to see like a whole group of people yelling out uh, nice things and like cussing off the, the head. Um, a, a project like this is, has been an interesting journey for us because of all the technical considerations involved in it. It does require a large footprint. Uh, it requires fog in order to see the lasers. And not all venues are good with these things. Lasers and phototransistors on the other side also need a certain type of stability in order to keep being accurate, like 17 feet across a room. So we've had a lot of technical considerations with that. Uh, in a game like this, we also uh, we had a high score for it. So it was designed so that people would want to keep playing, come back. And when we held it in our street level storefront and inviting people in, we'd have people who would come back day after day, be like, has anyone beat my high score? And then they'd come and try to beat it again. So it gets quite competitive. People even are competitive with themselves through it. This is actually an earlier project called Panoptodrome that we did for the Museum of Contemporary Art for an event called Videodrome, if anyone knows of that. And uh, so it's sort of like a surveillance base. And this is just to give you an idea of, this is an earlier project before the laser game, but it, we borrowed a lot of the same ideas and vibe. It sort of face-tracked people as they came through. So we wanted to keep a similar kind of personality to it. And from that, uh, we, um, through our laser game, we got the attention of a team that was working with Absolute Vodka, and uh, that they wanted us to light up the whole area of one of the Absolute parties. So what we decided to do is to make the entire bar top sound reactive, so that when the DJ plays, it pulses in Absolute Vodka Blue. And, but on top of that, each section of the bar top was also pressure sensitive, and we made them pressure sensitive to the exact pressure of the weight of what their glass is that they would be using. And when you press on it with your hand or the glass, it makes rainbows. And this was a fun one, even social interaction-wise, at the beginning going like, hey, Kyle, I bet that people are going to press it to call the bartender. And they totally did, which was really interesting. Um, so what you do when you, oh, it's a video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have a pile of switches, there's always the thought that maybe you can make a game of it. So when we first made this, we negotiated, as we do with a lot of our projects, because this is kind of a newish thing, doing experiential design. We have some freedom in the way that we make deals with people. We keep our tech most of the time. So we absorbed all of the things that we did here, and then we were able to repurpose it. And here, here's actually another photo. We actually designed a bunch of this party to be sound reactive with different visuals. So we absorbed all the tech of those tiles. And uh, especially given that we had only a one month turnaround for this project, we had to do everything like from conception design, ordering parts from all over the world, making this thing, setting it up in one month. We we're also like fairly new at this stuff at the time. Uh, it was really nice to be able to keep those tools and rework them and, and figure out how to utilize them better. And with that, we made a slap happy red versus blue tabletop arcade-ish game thing called Twister. <laughs> So 
Unlike the laser game, this takes up a much smaller footprint. We can just kind of like stick it in a truck and ship it out, and there it is. Uh, this has a really short interaction window. Gameplay is however long it takes your team to turn off your color before the other team turns off their color. And we find that because it's both cooperative, it's kind of two to 10 plus players, however many people fit around it. It has a cooperative uh, atmosphere to it. It also is competitive. It makes it so that it's more accessible to more people. And we find that all kinds of people are willing to kind of try it out and uh, they'll end up having dance moves with strangers in like two minutes which is wonderful. We've had a lot of fun presenting this to people. Um, which another thing that's interesting about it is people will walk up to it and like lean on it and then see that it lights up and they're like oh what's this thing and then they start pressing them and then they realize that the, the state changes when you turn off the colors and then everyone is playing the same game within 30 to 45 seconds. And I know this, I actually ran stats. I, I meticulously run stats on all of our projects. So yes, I do actually have a stat on how many times people talk about Catherine Zeta-Jones when we run the laser game. <laughs> uh, so 30 to 45 seconds, people figure out and they're all playing the same game, which is fascinating. I think they're keeping it really simple. Uh, people have fun with it. We had a lot of success running this for drunk people, so we decided that it would be possibly super fun to run it for children too. Uh, same demographic. <laughs> and so we reiterated over the past few months, this is for Toronto Digital Kids quite recently, to make it so that it's adjustable in height, so we have kid height version as well, so that they can reach over. And what's great about kids is they're smaller, so you can fit even more people around, as you can see. <laughs> um, yeah, so this... This is a good example of us like R&Ding the things that we already have, reiterating it, seeing new abilities to put it out for a whole different kind of social interaction and then trying it out, seeing what happens. Yeah. Yeah, and this is where um, a lot of what we do is, uh, there's a lot of interact, when we design interactive works for public, there's a lot of considerations. And this is kind of usually the checklist we have whenever a client has something, other than, you know, how much money do you got? But, um, so what are the environmental conditions? And like, this can be like, is there sound? Um, in the case of the laser, like, can we have fog? If the floor was uh, overhanging architecturally, we would need um, to embed the lasers in the walls. If it was a more solid floor, we could use stands, right? So we designed a lot of our stuff to be modular. Uh, how long is the interaction window, right? So, I mean, people, when they think interactive, they think, you know, let's say something web or a video game. And, like, we're not making, you know, 100-hour video game campaigns, right? We're making things for high-traffic events where people want short experiences, okay? Um, how many users can participate? Going from Leap, which was, like, totally immersive, but only one person can play at a time, other than the crowd spectacle, to Schwister, where smaller footprint, cheaper for certain clients, and more people can play simultaneously. Um, the other thing is, like, the laser game, we had to, like, physically operate it, which is another logistical thing. It took about eight hours to set up. You know, whereas the LED tile game takes about half an hour to set up, and it's automated, for the most part. Um, and a lot of also what we try to think of is like, so what do you, what do we want to see when we walk into a room, right? So um, I'm going to come back to the minimum viable product thing. So like, here's an example. This is something we designed for Spin, the ping pong uh, place in Toronto. So all they wanted was something that you, that greets you when you walk. Again, very simple. Uh, we remix. They saw. Okay, so they got our attention after they saw the absolute vodka thing, and then they checked out our other work, which was that face tracking panoptodrome thing. So it's kind of weird because, again, very simple project where it just tracks your face, right? Our original thing we made it was in a fine art context, where it's all about like surveillance and had this very eerie, overwhelming vibe. Then it turned into this kind of techy, pleasant greeting, right? Um, but like. With a lot of this stuff, again, we did go, it was a commission and we negotiate that we get to keep all the uh, um, te technological in infrastructure. So that allows us to do things like um, for Manifesto Festival, um, Aurora, we um, rebranded it. This is a rooftop party at the Drake. We were actually hired to design the entire aesthetic of the party. Yeah, so like this is where um, what gets really interesting about this is a lot of our projects, the components are modular um, and we're actually building a catalog of projects that get rented out. And with every project, it's sometimes, um, you know, we have some limitations with the client or budget, but then it turns into like R&D, paid R&D to feed back into our weird arty things that don't quite have a place yet because they're newer. Um, I mean, another example, like we do things like state, whoops, um, 
stage design for steam whistle. Right, so like this is another one where like we had never designed a stage. We had never um, done any video projection mapping. This thing was 26 feet wide, 16 feet high, and we pumped it out in two weeks. And we've done this for two years now. We've worked with this team uh, again, and it's sort of a projection map stage that's also reactive. But I mean, one of the things that we also kind of want to drive home with some of this is like, so electric perfume as a space, we try to house and showcase artists in the community and their work. But a lot of our projects that we build in electric perfume are actually designed for offsite and larger scale. So it's a good little feedback loop because even the artists that work in our space, uh, we can even contract in depending on the scale and budget of the project. Yeah. So I mean, other examples is we recently were at the uh, Toronto Light Festival with Reese. Uh, so this was like, uh, this is so new that we don't have video documentation yet. Um, so they're like LED rings, when you walk, they actually animate. Um, so they're going slow. You In, walk. The In the Reese colors. In the Reese colors. Our prototypes had really funky neon colors, which I liked a bit better. But again, this is cool because um, this is, Yes, we have to sit there and sometimes code things in like minus 25, just as an idea of this job. We had never made anything outdoor, weatherproof, winterproof before. So like, again, you start to get these little uh, notches on your belt in terms of skill sets, you know, and a lot of this is, um, you know, when we're making it. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna jump into something, um, our new prototype. So like, Leap was large scale, uh, Schwister slightly smaller scale, but a lot of um, the skills, again, we build is uh, we try to like really break down what, what is the like minimal viable product as an experience, okay? So what is the like less amount of work you can do to have a prototype that is still enjoyable, okay? So I actually have, we brought a game um, which I'm gonna run. So we need a couple, a couple volunteers. Um, so maybe I'll explain it first. So, uh, so what this is is these are two bicycle pumps that we've turned into controllers. So first person to uh, pump theirs up wins. So it is a bit physical, you do get a good workout. Uh, developing it, you get really good glutes and biceps, <laughs> right? So um, there's a, which side do you wanna throw in? So we're gonna throw oh, these gonna foam frisbees into the audience. If you catch it, um, you can play or you are, Playing. If you don't want it, then um, <laughs> pass it to someone who does. Or yeah. throw it and see what happens. Okay. So yeah. uh, orange on this side. Okay. Oh, did I threw that too far. <laughs> and if somehow you get injured, um, just don't sue us. So. <laughs> so anyone want to play? Okay, we got an orange. Do we have a blue? Blue. Awesome. awesome. So keep in mind, this is like an early prototypical project, is just you. to give you an idea of some things as a basis and to discuss some of these concepts. Okay, so uh, what's your name? Caitlin. Caitlin. So we have Caitlin, who I believe was orange, now I've mixed up the Frisbees. Yes, and you are? Soha? Soham. Soham, okay. Very nice, thank you for participating. I'm just gonna jump out into the game, okay? So... So I'm just gonna load up the game here. Again, very simple. Okay, so you're actually gonna be facing the screen so you can see what you're doing. Okay, and orange is on the left, I think. <laughs> Unless the box is upside down, I should do something about that. Okay, so who thinks orange is gonna win? Okay, who wants blue to win? <laughs> Okay, um, maybe later on we, more people can play, you can place bets, you know. Um, okay, so, um, so how this game's gonna work is there's gonna be a countdown, and then you just pump. And um, I've made it medium effort, I think. Okay, so if it's too hard, uh, maybe I'll jump out and just tweak a couple numbers, but um, it should be pretty good. Okay, so. Uh. Ah. <laughs> Orange wins. <laughs> um, and one thing, um, I'm actually horrible with names, so that's why I already forgot them, so don't take it personally. <laughs> um, okay, so maybe at the end, more people can play if you want. Uh, thank you for coming up and uh, playing it. Uh, everyone give them a...
Okay, so I'm going to jump out of coding mode back into um, presentation mode. Uh, it's kind of like Inception. Okay, so now that's the minimal viable product. So this is like the most bare bone. The graphics are very minimal, right? There's not much going on. There's two, right? Um, I mean, it's coded just in like a quick language. We're testing the sensors. But this is something that like as a quick experience, you know, you can churn out in like a couple of days. I mean, the original idea was a four person version in a more public installation thing. But what I'm getting at is if you can have an experience that's kind of engaging and a bit of a spectacle, um, you can, um, um, if, if, if you, again, really distill it down, um, then it's always easy to expand it and also fit it into different like settings and contexts and opportunities. So uh, this is actually what the hardware looks like. So there's two air pressure sensors just fit on an Arduino. Again, pretty basic stuff, actually. Um, but another thing about a lot of the projects that we house and a lot of the things we try to create is um, because they are designed for social things, um, it's, there's always a couple considerations. So, like, you, so, okay, so there's a bit of our philosophy, and it's like kind of, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, interaction is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it's probably not very good, right? So, a lot of our stuff, because we're dealing with public things, people aren't often operating them. We have to, like, massage people and kind of manipulate them into behaving the way we want them to. But were they directly telling them how? Yes. So like in, in some cases, like, okay, let's say like that um, party where everyone's sending in assets at Electric Perfume. Yeah, you do have to explain it because they need to know to email it. But you try to make it accessible that everyone can walk in and experience it. Um, in the case of the laser game, again, Got to kind of have to explain it, but there's people get attracted to it because they walk and they see a room full of lasers and this like breathing and it's all surround sound and controllable DMX lights. Also, if you see someone playing the laser game, you get it. Yeah. So um, interaction is uh, contagious and it's also often learned behavior. Which is sometimes super hilarious because people will interact with something in a really weird way and then everybody immediately after starts doing everything in that really weird way. Yeah. So <laughs> if you have bad habits, people also send to copy those. <laughs> Um, or as again, a game like Schwister, again, uh, it's very, very, very simple. It's literally designed that anyone can figure it out. I again, it's very like minimalist in its design, but that's kind of the point, right? And a lot of what this stuff is, you have to think about the context and that it's experienced. So what, um, in this case, again, these are bicycle pumps. Um, I think everyone kind of knows how to use a bicycle pump, but then, you know, if you have a large screen or our original design is LED meters, right? Um, you throw in something that's, n you throw in something familiar, right? And a lot of these interfaces are kind of learned, but then you throw in something unexpected, right? And you give them a bit of a reward. So the first thing you need usually is, I call it the lure or anglerfish psychology. Everyone knows anglerfish? Yep, that fish with the like kind of uh, bioluminescent bulbs. So, how the how, how this works is um, so these are in deep water, and then other fish see a light. Well, they think it's the light, and fish kind of go towards the light because that usually means sun, especially when you're in the deep. And then they get eaten by the anglerfish. Okay, so a lot of this is you know with interactive stuff, you have to start to think about how do you get people to do the initial thing to kind of suck them in. Um, so I mean. Schwister, again, bringing this up. You know, it's a big light up table. People like light in a dark room. Um, also, side note about a lot of our stuff, it's really hard to document because it's always in dark rooms. So uh, that's kind of a thing. But generally, if they see a light, they'll see it animate, they'll want to touch it, right? But like, again, um, giant LED tiles aren't in anyone's living room per se, right? So once they touch it and they see it reacting, they start to understand the relationships. And a lot of this stuff, too, is designed for people t as an icebreaker. So they all kind of come together and figure it out together. And that's part of the fun. Like, we're, we're really interested less in, like, home consumable interactive media and things that are more like open social interfaces. So, and with a lot of this, you have to, like, talk to um, the different brain systems. So, like, you really got to focus on the mammal and lizard brain in the triune brain theory. So. Uh, Lizard brain is kind of like fight or flight primitive, but that's like instinct. So you have to work on what is natural for people, you know, and that's 
design concepts. The mammal brain is um, habits, emotions, memories, right? And that's another thing. So like, for example, um, Pump Game, this is the second time it's been shown. Last time I showed it, uh, we showed it to a uh, school, high school. And just like the public spectacle in the entire auditorium of 700 people, right? Like that's what's giving the emotional response and then you start to get the lineups and stuff. So again, the, the spectacle and emotion or verbal abuse training camp and leap, it's insulting you. People are getting pissed off because they're losing, right? So again, you're actually like affecting their emotion and um, that even changes the way they behave. Actually, even on the topic of drunk people with that laser game, there's a curve of like, mm -hmm. they start to drink and they get better and then they drink more <laughs> and then they start to get worse. Because <laughs> there's actually high scores and you compete against everyone who's ever played the game. So people start to do speed runs, people, right? And once again, it's like all these little tricks that you do to get people to continually play. Um, also, Side note is, you know, you have to appeal to the mammal brain. Um, these are early, before we had the studio, these are our dev shots. Um, so I was trying to do laser detection tests to see if it would crash or anything. The cat kept setting it off because it kept seeing the laser. <laughs> so again, we knew we were dealing with the mammal brain. When we were twisting wires, the other cat was... Attacking the wires. Attacking the wires. <laughs> so again, you know, check, you're appealing to the mammal brain. Um, this is a lizard person. I don't, do you know, if you know about the reptilian race, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so again, uh, you know, you got to go to things that are again instinctual and um, hit people in a yeah more primitive way. So I'm going to show you another example of this quickly, um, which is a prototype we've developed. So and again, using the basic concept. So this is fun fur. Everyone knows what fun fur is, right? Very it's a furry fabric. Furry fabric, right? You pet it. Apparently it's fun. So, all it is is fun for with uh, like capacitive sensors embedded in LEDs, right? And what we're designing is like a full furry room. Um, again, demographic are easy, intoxicated people room. and children. Um, so, but Again, what we're kind of feeding off of is the idea that, okay, it's fur, what do people like to do? You know, your innate reaction is, I see something furry, I pet it. Then again, you give them something. That, usually when I pet furry things, they don't light up, right? So that's the thing that they memorize and then take their Instagram video and assuming the low light levels can facilitate it um, and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, again, you can still always build on top of that system. So like. If you touch multiple sections, maybe something else happens. And this goes a lot into, again, on the topic of psychology, is we really try to feed off the things that um, dopamine in the brain. So um, with a lot of interactive stuff, you want to give the pleasure. So dopamine is what we experience when we play games, which includes gambling, when we exercise, when we have sex, when we, um, like, all those things that kind of keep us kind of healthy and fun. Um, so we try to design experiences that you utilize these things. So for example, um, there, usually with a lot of game stuff, there is a bit of a euphoria when you win, right? There is a fitness level to some of, or I won't say fitness, I'll say physical. And that's, um, again, a lot of our stuff is designed to be accessible and accommodate different body types and whatnot. Um, but Again, these are the kind of things as interaction designers that we really try to um, attack um, for our kind of users. Um, so we're going to end very shortly and probably open up for questions. And if there are no questions, then we can just, um, again, uh, play more of that, I think. Mm -hmm. So, but one thing we really want to um, finish off on the idea is like the technology itself is in special. Okay? Because uh, What's always special is the experience. And this is where, again, we try to really keep the idea of like open environments. Um, I mean, another example is like why, not that we're against like, let's say AR or VR, but you know, a lot of interactive experiences in a social setting, you know, we're less into this, right? And we're into more ways that people can openly approach something and kind of connect. and. Uh, ways of technology bring people together to socialize and play. Um, play is very important. 
Okay, so um, before questions, if you do want to find us, uh, this is our... Like, Electric perfume on all the things. All the things. <laughs> we grab that up. So, um, on that note, are there any questions? Yep. Um, you, you mentioned about uh, accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering... Uh, oh, thanks. I have a microphone. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering... Um, do, are there ever circumstances where you sort of have to introduce like cheats into it? Uh, for like as an example, I worked on an experience where like a world class athlete might wind up competing with a ten year old in the same experience, and uh, I'm just wondering like have you have you ever like needed to tweak an interface in order to make it fun and and just keep it enjoyable for everyone involved? So the question is if we uh, need to tweak an interface in order to make something more accessible to a, bro a broader variety of people. Uh, something like the laser game is a good example of that. As we mentioned that we tried to make that accessible, uh, wheelchair accessible, also good for different body types. But also we had things like uh, a, a child with severe anxiety who, who didn't like the sound of the big boom when you fail. So we were able to turn that off and have him still go through. And eventually we accidentally didn't turn it off and he made it through the whole way without doing it, which we're really happy about. Uh, but also with that game, we can rewrite levels on the fly. So if someone is really having trouble for whatever reason, uh, if they can't fit through something or like whatever the reason is, we can kind of shift it around. So these are considerations we've tried to build into how we present. Yeah, and again, because the game's more about uh, timing, you know, and there's the three levels. So like even in the design of it, we had to think of how to make it fun for people that are tall and so that young children couldn't hack it by just mm. crawling over everything. Or sliding underneath it. Yeah, and they, they try. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, they really try. Um, but also, uh, we actually even, uh, so like some things that, you know, like side details is like, we're actually controlling operating the game. We, have, we control it all via like an iPad. We can control the speed of the levels. Um, so people keep track of what level they are. We have multiple levels. So as they beat one level, the challenge goes up. And then we have scores respective for each one. So like, even if someone's on level three and doing their speed runs and someone's behind, they're still getting some sort of experience. Or, you know, we'll ask them, they may request that it's a bit slower, right? So a lot of this is like, again, something flexible and dynamic that we can control on the spot. And we kind of design that in because, you know, when you have a thousand people in a room, that's a lot of experiences to account for. So. Any other questions? Oh, okay, another one, okay. Uh, I'll go. Uh, <laughs> I love what you guys are doing. Uh, oh, thank really you. Cool. Um, just wondering, uh, you mentioned about uh, like having a community and uh, collaborating with uh, some of the makers in your space and so forth. Like, how does that work? Like, what do you what do you look for? How does can you do you have an example of that? So you're asking how we collaborate with the with the community and how do we collaborate with different groups? So we've uh, ha built a connection with various different groups, such as the Hand Eye Society, which is a uh, not for profit. Uh, oh sure, actually yeah, uh, we, we have a slide on this. We had so. a bonus slide if we yeah, had time. Yeah. So. Um. <laughs> Curious Cabinets is a free all-ages exhibit devoted to the exploration of video game arcade hardware and how to change the way gamers play. These arcade cabinets have been uniquely designed to encourage new ways of considering game design and the concept of public play. Curious Cabinets is a free exhibit exploring new ways of thinking about gaming and arcade hardware while supporting local developers. This whole process is a three-way collaboration between Spritebox Arcade, the Hand-Eye Society, and the Electric perfume with support from the Toronto Arts Council. We put a public... Okay. So something like this, uh, we collaborated with different groups. Uh, we got a grant from the Toronto Arts Council to support various artists throughout Toronto. So we uh, collectively curated who was going to be involved in it and, and helped to support them in the development of this. So that's an, one example of how we uh, connect with other groups. But we also have people who come to us out of the blue and they'll discuss like, hey, I have this idea, but I don't know how to do the tech. Or hey, I have this idea, but this this whole element of it, or hey, I don't know how to monetize this. And we'll experiment with them. We're open to just discussing new models for things and trying things out. Uh, 
Yeah. But and, and I think a, a couple other things is this is where uh, we're kind of unique in that um, with in comparison to some of the other art spaces, we're kind of community and fine art and commercial. So like we kind of do both streams. And um, we're also very fun centric. Um, we got a bit, uh, I'll say cynical towards going to a lot of art galleries before the space and just being very bored. Or like, you know, kind of, um, again, it's just not fun. It's not a good energy. Things are very like kind of static. So like usually the first thing we're thinking of, is it fun? And if people come with us with fun ideas, we try to make it happen, assuming it's feasible. All right, well, thank you for that que those questions. Uh, this is all the time that we have. Thank you for sitting through our talk. Yes. <laughs>